um, you should have on page 14, I'm sorry, page six. In, in Mishnah 14, you should have the uh, base, picture of the base. Yeah. And then uh, a picture of the Aleph with the base in it. So that if you're on that, you're on the right page. But here, Mishnah 14, paragraph 14. Okay, so why is the letter base closed on all sides and open in the front? In other words, of all four sides, three of the sides are completely closed off and only the front of it is open as, as you see here, this is the front and top, side, bottom are all completely closed off. This teaches us that, that it is it is a house, a bayit. So again, this kind of looks like, um, you know, an interesting type of house. That's the ceiling, chimney. That's the floor. That's the wall. That would be the full window, you know. So it's either a house with uh, a wall that's open, or if you want to use your imagination, there's an invisible, it's, it's kind of open here. Like think of like a house with a big window, a big bay window, right? So now what does a house usually represent? Usually represents space or time and space. And um, here he calls it that the house, the bays is, it is the house of the world. God is in the place of the world and the world is not his place. Let me, let me explain what that means. What, it, what it's basically saying, it's a, it's a rabbinic statement that we are within God's space. The world, the universe as we know it is within God, but God is not within it, meaning it's not that God is a particular entity that takes up a certain amount of space and, and is limited and is contained within space. Rather, space is contained within God. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, he's not contained within space. Yeah. Um, God is in the place of the world, and the world is not in his place. Do not read bait, but buy it, house. Let me read that to you in the Hebrew. I was interested to understand it better to look at the Hebrew. Yeah, it, it, sound, it makes more sense in Hebrew. See, I, I, and when I see it in the Hebrew, to me, I understand it as God is the place. God is what allows for there to be space. But it's not that the opposite, that because the world exists, that God can also exist, or God exists within that framework alone. In other words, God... So what... what in, in Kaplan mentions in an earlier comment about the base, that the base is the, um, the, the, the word that represents the interface between Sovev and Mimala, between the, the transcendent God that transcends time and space and the imminent God, the divine within the realm of time and space. Okay, so... Um, Rabbi, can I just say yeah. um, that I heard the bait, and I don't know how much it plays into this, but the base is, you know, what that's why the the base is the first letter of uh, of Bereshit, and the that, that aleph plays is the second letter. To this. But it's the house, it's the house for the aleph, 
And the other is there yeah. and it's not that it's there and it's there. It's so we're going to be doing that. We, we already mentioned, I think, uh, what you're saying. The first thing you said, David, was mentioned uh, earlier. And the, the second thing you said will be, will be coming up to it later today okay. when you see the bays within the olive. So we're going to do both. We, we, we're going to do both of those things. If you, um, in, in, in number three, it says, why does the Torah begin with the letter Bays? There it gives the answer, it's a blessing. But here it's going to continue with that, that, that concept as well. So it is thus written in, in uh, Mishle, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 3, with wisdom the house is built, with understanding it is established, and with knowledge its chambers are filled. Now let's take a look at that verse using Sepharia. Um, I'm not going to be able to show it on the computer because I'm not good enough to do the share screen, and I'm actually using my phone. So well, look up the verse says the following. A house is built by wisdom and it is established by understanding. And then it continues in the next verse. By knowledge are its rooms filled with all precious and beautiful things. Now, this verse is quoted at least two more times in the Bahir. The next time it's quoted is in Mishnah 55. And there it uses the verse... And what is by it? It says, I'll read it to you. What is the by the bait at the end? And it quotes this verse in Proverbs says, Wisdom will the house by it be built. The verse does not say was built, but will be built in the future. God will build and decorate it thousands, thousands of times more than it was. As we have said, why does the Torah begin with a bait? As it is written, another verse in, a verse in Proverbs, another verse. I was with him as a craftsman. I was his delight for a day, a day frolicking before him at the very, at, at every time. There are 2,000 years, which are the beginning. So two, but the scripture says seven, as it is written in Isaiah, the light of the, the moon shall be like the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold like the light of the seven days, and it was said just like the sun was for seven, so the moon was for seven. I, uh, he replied, I said thousands. So you've got this idea of apayim shana kadma laolam, this idea of 2,000, usually it's said in reference to the Torah, preceding the creation of the world by 2,000 years. And he's learning that in part from the base and from the idea of the this this other verse, this this other verse in Proverbs eight thirty, so that's the second time that the that the uh, verse is used, also in the context of a base, and the third time is in Mishnah one hundred five. And again, we just mentioned seven. It's interesting, right? We just come out of Hanukkah, which is seven. 
we mentioned because that's the seven days of the week that he mentions the sevenfold powers of the sun that will be revealed in the messianic time and in 105 it's towards the end of 105 if you want to look it up it's on page page uh, 40 and there it's talking about the holidays about the length of the holidays so for example it begins 105 by saying, why is Shavuot one day? Because the Torah was given to Israel on that day. And when the Torah was created in the beginning, the Blessed Holy One ruled his world alone with it. This idea of only one. It's thus written in Psalm 111, verse 10, in the beginning is wisdom, the fear of God. Uh, that being so, your holiness shall be yours for yourself. And what is Sukkot? He replied, the letter bait. Again, a sukkah is a booth, the bait is a, is a letter that connotates a home or a booth, which has the connotation of a house by it. It is thus written in Proverbs, same verse, 24-3, with wisdom the ha house is built. And how do we know that Sukkot has the co connotation of a house? This is written, Jacob traveled to Sukkot, he built himself a house, and for his livestock he built Sukkot. Therefore, he named the place Sukkot. Right? Interesting that he gives it the, the name that preceded the holiday, the first time we're introduced to the word Sukkot in the Torah from, from Genesis. Okay, so that's a little bit about that verse. Now let's talk, talk about for a moment the base itself. Um, usually, Bayes is Bina. Here, Arya Kaplan points out that Bayes is Chachma in the, in the uh, Bahir and that the Aleph is going to connotate Keter. And now you'd say, wouldn't it make more sense for the Beit to be Bina? Because Bina makes more sense like dimensions. Bina is more critical thinking analysis that you could have depth and width and, 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 and intellectually speaking. But yet we find that there's a reason why we're connecting the letter base specifically to Chachma, to, to beginning, because it is, it's not the ultimate in beginnings, but it's the beginning of revelation. It's the beginning of existence. Or you could say it is that which, which makes that which is not into something. Yesh me'ayin, something from nothing. Question is, where does something from nothing happen? Does it happen in Chachma? Um, or does it happen in Kata, or does it happen in Bina? So we're going to learn that the somethingness of the world, the Bayit, happens within Chachma here. And beyond that, Aleph is going to be Kata. We'll, we'll continue to see how that plays out in, in Mishnah 15, page 7. What does the Beit resemble? It is like a man formed by God with wisdom. He is closed in all sides, but open in front, which means physically we're, we're closed off. Our back is closed. Our sides are closed. It's only our face that, that is open, so to speak. So the, 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 the bait, likewise, is all closed off, except it has like a face. It has a punim that's open to uh, connecting to the world around it. The Aleph, however, is open from behind. This teaches us that the tail of the bait is open from behind. If, if not for this, man could not exist. Likewise, if not for the bait and the tail of the Aleph, the world would not exist. That is a very cool picture that shows you exactly how to see within the Aleph the base. So you notice, if, if you fill that in, because that's part of the Aleph, the Aleph, unlike the base, has an opening behind it. Um, so the way Kaplan uh, explains it is, the Aleph is Keter. Keter's relationship with, with the Orient self is open. There's not a wall that separates them. The Chachma, already there's, there's a, great, a much greater distance between the Chachma to the Ain self than it is from Keter to Ain self. Because Chachma is the beginning of conceiving an idea, even if it's a divine idea, it's still coming into, into being. But since the point of the Keter is not just for its own sake, but to be, it's, it's a, 
it's a mashpia. It's it's receiving in order to give. It's like it's like a it's like a pipe almost that doesn't have um, a solid bait kibble, a solid receptacle to, to receive within it in and of itself. It's just taking and giving almost instantaneously. So in that way, it receives and gives, like it's a receiver giver. I mean, yes, there is something in the middle between the receiving and the giving. There's a line that somehow mitigates the flow. You could maybe see within it, 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 it holds back something what we would call later the tzimtzum or some type of thing like that. Now the base is in here because the letters have what we call later in Kabbalah, which means inter-inclusion. The base already exists on some level within the Aleph. And then it manifests more fully as its own letter base. That means Chachma exists within Bina. If it only existed as, if, if or actually the opposite, Chachma, not, not the opposite, Chachma existed within Kete. We're learning like that. If it if it just existed for the first time within Chachma, not within Keter, the world wouldn't be able to exist. Which means that the spirit need to have some element from before that sphere. Chachma needed to have to, to to somehow already exist in a in a latent state within the framework of Keter. Okay. Let's take a look at um, the Sefer Habahir, the commentary of the Araganus. Okay, a couple of things he says. Okay, so Kaplan was pretty much basing himself on just, you know, the text itself and, and, and probably this commentary, the Arganus. So the Arganus says, why is the, the, bi, the base, Stumami Kotsad, closed from all sides except the front? He says, because it's Atziluda Rishonah, it's the first emanation from Keter Elyon, and it is Chachma, and it's only open in its front so that it could continue to, to emanate out of it uh, through that opening, which is through the medium of the Lamed Beis Siva Tliot Chachma, the 32 pathways of intellect that we talked about in the Sefi Yitzira. Um, And he says, that, that in a way, if the base is Chachma, which is divine Chachma, um, it, it, it is, it is, relative to the rest of creation, uh, more like the creator. It isn't actually the creator. It's part of, it, it, it's, it's also an intermediary between the creator and the creation. The creation itself, that, that is ego ex existence, feeling that it exists in its own account, that would be more like Bina. If you think of it very simply, when you're receiving the initial insight of, of a, a new insight that's like you didn't know it before the moment that you're getting it in its most purest unadulterated form you know you're receiving you know it's not you 
it's coming from outside of you. Once you've received it and then you start analyzing it, then as soon as that happens, it doesn't take more than a half a second to associate the further development of those thoughts with your ego. Sometimes they're so, they're, the, the person forgets that moment of euphoria. David Newton, you hear what I'm saying? The Chachma represents the euphoria of receiving something from beyond yourself. The Bina represents your ability to make it yours. But in the Bina, which is, which is God's gift to us, that, that us, our ego, our sense of our own accomplishment, so we can be responsible for our lives and our actions, we right away start getting confused and thinking that we are, you know, we, we even created the Chachma. So that's the, that's the challenge. But really, the Bina comes from Chachma, which is de definitely from God. Everything is from God. But I'm saying the Bina is where we thrive in our like domain, so to speak. That's the, the space represents our domain. But we shouldn't think that our space defines God, like we control the Chachma, we control the Keter. No, the, the Chachma is reminding us that it, it, it ultimately inspires what comes after. Bina would only exist because of the gift of Chachma, which is, which is divine light. Um, or that it might, might not be the divine essence or even the orange self in its pre sephirotic configuration. Now, so really it's interesting because when we say bias, he says don't, it's a bias. The verse he interprets Bechachma Yivna bias means with a Chachma with the sphere of Chachma, he gives birth to the second, the next sphere of Bina. Okay. Okay. But nevertheless, it's still, but the, but the base is still Chachma. It's with Chachma that it, 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 it holds within it the, the birth of time and space. And why is it like a human being? Because a human being is created with wisdom. And, and what's the wisdom of the, of the physical form? We're all closed off. We're only open to one side. So he says... If you look at the human form, which is formed with wisdom, you have 248 evarim, limbs, organs. And um, there's the only one of the organ, of, of the human organs that is able to, the reproductive organ is, is facing forward. That's the circumcision. Um, and, and, and that has the key, that has the continuity in it to be able to create a new being. And that's similar to the base, which is closed from all sides and open in the front. And then he gets back to Keter, is called Machshava and Rosh, called the uh, thought and head. And the, 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 the head of the person, which is where the thoughts are processed, um, are enc enclosed within the, the cavity of the, of the brain, which has a skeletal, the skull around it. And, and its opening is the mouth. The, the, the opening of the mouth allows for somebody's ideas to be expressed. And, or even better, to remain silent, because he quotes the Pirkei Avos that says, Siag l'chachma shtika. The, the protection or the guarding of wisdom is through silence.
Now, this is interesting. He says, why is it so? He explains, but now we get to the Aleph. The Aleph contains the bays in it. He says, without the Aleph containing the bays, the world wouldn't continue to exist. He's like, why not? So he says, because there, there is no person that will not sin. And when they sin, if they just exist in their current state, they've disconnected their soul from their source. So how will they continue to exist? But since, in fact, the source of the soul is really mushrash, it's really sourced within the earlier letter, within the Aleph, within Keter, we can always reconnect our soul to its source. So even if we temporarily disconnected ourselves from God through a sin, we reconnect to a deeper source, which is the base within the Aleph. So he's learning that as part of Chuba, the, the, the mystical return to a deeper level of the soul. Okay. And then he also connects it to Tchiat HaMesim. There's different Girsa Ot here that he brings down. Okay, let's continue. Any questions on that? Well, it does seem to be trying to elevate Aleph to not just simply being like not part of this whole system. A lot of the ones... Um, not all if I mean sorry um, Keter doesn't you know Keter is just an opening basically for the other areas yeah I mean I, I think you could also really read that the base is is Chachma turning into Bina there is a valid way to yeah. read that right. and that Aleph is Chachma and Keter turning into Chachma I don't see, you know, I don't see there that as being problematic to read it like that. Um, because they have a similar shape, they're to be treated similarly. Well, well, that, well, that's one element is that the, the base already is contained within the aleph, um, but but in addition to that, because he kind of references the house to the bays is both the wisdom that the house is built with. So if you read it simply, it is the wisdom, then the base is wisdom. But if you read it, it is the wisdom that the house is built with. It would mean it is the Chachma that builds the Bina. Well, there's two ways of reading that. It is the Chachma that, that builds the Bina. The, the Chachma is the interiority of the base and Bina is its exteriority, something like that. Or Chachma is, is the base, which creates the rest of the world, which is the real space, time and space. You can read it either way. Okay, let's do uh, Mishnah 16. Rabbi Rechumai said, Illumination preceded the world. Since it is written in Psalm 97.2, cloud and gloom surround him. It is thus written in Genesis, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. They said to him, before the creation of Israel, your son, will you make him a crown? He replied, yes. What does this resemble? A king yearned for a son. One day he found a beautiful, precious crown, and he said, this is fitting for my son's head. 
They said to him, are you certain that, the, that your son will be worthy of this crown? He replied, be still, that is what arises in my thought or in thought. It is thus written in the second uh, Samuel 2, ver, uh, chapter 14, verse 14. He thinks thoughts that none shall be cast away. Okay, so two things, and then we'll look up these verses. There's three verses to look up here. One is, this is an allusion to God having a conversation with the angels. It's mentioned in the Talmud of the Medrash, where God has this conversation saying like, you know, what's the, what am I doing? is one version of that which is when it came time for creation, God consulted with the souls of the righteous. In other words, God had a conversation with what would happen in the future, and he liked what he saw. And um, that as another parallel, which is when he created the light, he saw that the light was good for the tzaddikim, but not good for the rishayim. So he hid it away for the righteous. Um, so that's one thing that God already, you know, he doesn't have his children yet, but he's planning on having them. So he's already created, he makes them the crown. And then the angels, who are the ones saying, are you sure you know what you're doing? It's got to be the angels. They're the ones who are always starting up. And God says, that's what I want. Now, that, that statement, that's what I want, is one of the harsher statements in the Talmud. When terrible things happen, um, God's response is, is shistok, 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 be quiet, that's what I want. Um, but it also means a desire that doesn't have a good answer for how it's going to get there, it's just the way it's going to be. Can't answer it, it's cat there. Okay, now. That's the first thing, all those midrashim kind of to fill it in, parallel midrashim. The other thing is, this is reminiscent of a Chabad legend or parable, very reminiscent of it. Um, I'm studying Chabad now. It's not like I haven't done it in the past, but I have a project I'm working on now, so I'm looking into uh, Chabad Hasidus, the Alter Rebbe in particular. So one of the stories with Alter Rebbe is that he had an inter-Hasidic um, disagreement between other Rebbe's, most notably Arn of uh, Kalisk, where they felt that uh, Kabbalah still was, by and large, a, a um, esoteric discipline that uh, the average person shouldn't be uh, taught it. It had to be very guarded. And the Baal Shem Tov felt that uh, the, the Hasidus allowed a, a special dispensation to do away with some of those safeguards and to reveal did, more. Did you, the mean the, did you mean the Baal Hatanya? I meant the Baal Hatanya. Thank you, Zev. It's a good Freudian slip. Yeah. Yeah. So, so at one point in the conversation, the following analogy came out from supposedly the Alter Rebbe of Chabad. Um, I, I mean, there's no reason to doubt that it uh, came from his mouth, but, you know, it's, uh, I wasn't there when he said it. Uh, the analogy he said is, imagine a king has an only child who's, who's fallen ill, and there is no known treatment in the world to save the child from this ill, except bar one. And it so happens that the one treatment is the crown jewel that literally is the centerpiece of the, of the king of the crown, which represents the kingdom. It would need to be taken, the, the, the crown would be dismantled, the, 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 the um, precious gem would have to be ground and put into a, a um, mixture of liquid and then they would try to administer it as a medicine to the sick uh, uh, child. And if it could get in and he could swallow it, he would survive. And the parable continues and says, there was, a, you know, this is the crown jewel. You don't destroy it lightly. But right now, the, the people, 
The Jewish people are weak. They're, if you let them go and don't give them, this is their medicine, this will revive them. If you don't give it to them, they will be lost. And now read this again, which is the king yearned for his son. I'm going to say the king yearned for his son to be well. And there was no cure. One day the doctor said there's a, the most beautiful, precious crown, the jewel of the crown. That is what will get your son to be well. And those who oppose that opinion said, are you going to destroy the crown because of maybe we don't even know if the child will survive with it. We don't even know that I'll do that. And he replied, be still. This is what arises in my thought. So again, because if you see that the crown is a metaphor for the light, which is a metaphor for Kabbalah, the two parables are really very similar in nature. Like what allows the, the Tanaim or Amaraim or Ga'onim or Rishonim, whatever, whoever they were that were, were writing the Sefer Abba here, what allows them to now reveal these teachings? What right do they have to teach these teachings? Is it, what if no, nothing comes out of it? You're, in other words, the premise is we're going to teach this and it's going to revitalize people and make the, inspire them. How do you know? How do you know it's going to work? Maybe you're just doing it for nothing. You're going to, people will now have sophistry. They'll have some games to play, some, some pickup lines to use, but it's not like it's really going to do anything. God says, no, this is what I want right now. This is the time for this wisdom to be revealed. Okay, now let's take a look at some of these verses. Called the Kohinoor diamond. Say it again, David. The Kohinoor diamond is the diamond in the center of the Queen's crown. The ah, crown so crown. now we know. And the um, name of the, uh, we, that, I'm going to be more specific next time I tell this this parable. And Kohinoor is translated from Persian, which means the mountain of light. Wow, very yeah. appropriate. Well, can I can I ask a question? Yes. This is more like historical, but since you brought up the the, the Baal Hatania in that issue, and, and then of course mm -hmm. the, the Vilna Gaon is of course opposed to all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When does historically finally and Moses Lozato before all this said, no, you can you can teach this stuff. So when does it suddenly become kosher the next generation when when um uh the nefesh Ahayim, um his i think his daughter married into a hasidic family and so you think that's when it gets to be kosher it, it all started to uh it started to um um, I think it all started, there, there was always animosity, but it all started to uh, reconcile itself within a generation. So, so um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to plead the fifth. I'm going to make a special video to answer your question, Yasi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally working on that. That is one of the things I'm working on right now. So rather than, yeah, yeah I could sure. answer you, but that would be, you know, take up the rest of the time. I just was it's been on my mind. I thought it, it, it has a parallel, even though you could say, why are you using something that happened, you know, hundreds of years later? Uh, but, but I think there's a, there's a nice parallel between them. But, but to, to, to clear up how that worked with the Vilna Gone, by the way, it wasn't even, the funny thing is, it wasn't just the Vilna Gone, it was his own contemporaries within the Hasidic movement that had issues with the type of Hasid as he was teaching, that's a little hint, and we'll get, and, and yeah. by the way, yeah, not everyone's over it yet. <laughs> <laughs> David's right that, 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 that it was softened in the time of the Nefesh Chaim, but it wasn't, uh, the war's not over. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Once in a while, I meet somebody who says, by the way, I still hold the cherem of the Vilna Gong. I still hold the chassidimar of the cherem. Uh. <laughs> like, no. So people they are still they nervous. They don't really mean it. They just say it to like stir you up a little bit. Some, yeah. some people are still nervous about what happened in the 1600s. Forget about the Hasidim. They think we're going to do something even worse if they're not careful. Yeah, yeah. There was, yeah. I don't want to get sidetracked, but there was a whole thing with uh, Spinoza recently with the letter from the, the that whole. I don't want to get. I was thinking it. more Shabtai Tzvi, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, let's continue. Um, <coughs> take a look at a couple of those verses. So the first one is Bayom uh, he are be he are. God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's, there's so much to look into there that we're not going to. And then we'll look at, um, actually, I don't know why he doesn't quote. Um, Kimot Namut, the verse in Samuel. For some reason, the one in Psalms he doesn't bring down here. The, the, the verse in Samuel says, Kimot Namut, the Chamai Manigram Artsasha, and Lo Yasapolisa, the Kim Nevish, the Chashim Machabot, the Vilti Yidach Menonidach. We must all die. We are like water that is poured out on the ground and cannot be gathered up. God will not take away the life of one who makes plans so that no one may be kept banished. Um, which, if you ask me, is is very reminiscent of this idea of of Amech Kulam Sadikim Olam Yishu Arts Neitzer Matai Masay Yadai Lisbar that we're all we're all righteous. In other words, it, it's it's continuing this this concept of God created the world in a way that even if we fail, there's there's a there's a trap door. There's a way back to fix our souls. It's the same thing. Nobody's going to be pushed away. Okay. So. Yeah, I don't think it needs more explanation than that. We could always find, I'm sure there's, there's great explanations, but let's go to page eight to number 17. Rabbi Amarai sat and expounded. Did I, did I? Yeah, I finished that. Why is letter Aleph at the beginning? In other words, of the Aleph base, not of the Torah, because base is the first letter of the Torah, because it was it was everything, it was before everything, even the Torah. So basically, Aleph is higher than the Torah. And that makes sense if we're saying that it's Kata. And let's just continue once we're at it. 18. Why does the base follow it? Because it was first. Why does it have a tail? To point to the place from which it came. Some say from there the world is sustained. Yes. So there's a relationship between Aleph and Bayes. Um, Bayes is a follower. But at the same time, it's the first when it comes to Torah. Aleph is so high that it precedes even Torah. And the, 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 the tail of the base is almost like when a child is born, they, they, they have an um, umbilical cord where, where the umbilical cord was, is now, um, what do they call it in English? The oh, navel? Oh, oh, what? Belly. Belly belly. Yeah, yeah. Because that's where that shows you where it came from. You came from the womb, you know. So the base comes from the olive, so it has like a little belly button facing what it came from, the olive. So that means that Adam and Eve um, didn't have belly buttons. Well, they would have had it, it just would have been a cosmological belly button of the base. It would be their tail. <laughs> Are you asking if Jesus Christ had a belly button? No. He was born of a mother, actually. <laughs> yeah. I call Moidim that he was born of a mother. He did have uh, a mother. Yeah. That would be more interesting if somebody was born without a mother. They're working on uh, that now. Uh -huh. In the meantime. Uh -huh. 
19. What, why is the Gimel third? It has three parts, teaching us that it bestows kindness. The Gemara says that the Gimel Dalit is Gomel Dalim. By the way, the Gemara also says that the, the base is a bias, it's a house. So a lot of these things are not completely original. They're already contained within the Talmud or some variation of the Talmud. So Gimel is a giver. And is, is almost, it, there's three things we associate Gimel with, right? A Gamal, which is a camel. Go, a Gomel, which is to be kind or to wean, like a, like a nurse, a mother nursing. Uh, be gamel. When, when, a, when a child was three, they used to be weaned off being nursed by their mother. So it has three parts. It's like a person standing. It's got like two legs and a torso and a head top because it bestows, grows, and sustains. So he breaks that down into three components. Bestows, grows, sustains. It is thus written in Genesis 21, verse 8, the lad grew and was bestowed. He said, he says the same as I do. He grew and bestowed kindness to his neighbor and to those who entrusted to him. And we'll do one more, 20. Why, and why is there a tail at the bottom of the gimel? He said, the gimel has a head on top and it's like a pipe, just like a pipe. The gimel draws from above and through its head and then disperses it through its tail. This is gimel. Okay, so let's see. Let's take a look at that verse in Genesis. The verse says the following. The child grew up and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. So let's see what the Kabbalah says. By here we just did. Let's take a look at what the Zohar says. The Zohar says the following. When he, the Abraham is, you know, he's the such a kind person, and he makes a party, and it says in that verse, Abraham makes a big party for the weaning of Isaac. So. He invited all the leaders of the generation. And it's known that when there's a banquet, the accuser wanders around looking to see if people give out charity and if there are poor people invited. And, and if they're poor people, the accuser leaves the house and doesn't come in. But if not, the accuser could come in. And if he sees that there's a party without the poor, he ascends above and brings accusations against them. Okay. But the, the basic premise here is the gimel is to give. And in Kabbalah, this idea of, of uh, yunika or, or uh, nursing is, allow, uh, is, is, is a stage in the spiritual development of a soul. Now let's do one more Mishnah. It's a big one, Mishnah 21. Rabbi Yochanan said, the angels were created on the second day. It is therefore written in Psalm 104, verse 3, he rafters his upper chambers with water. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks on the wings of the wind. And then it is written in Psalm 104, 4, the next verse, he makes the wind his angels. He ministers from flaming fire. So he, he uses clouds as chariots and walks on the wings of the wind. 
and makes the wind his angels and his ministers from flaming fire. Hanina said the angels were created on the fifth day. So Rabbi Yochanan says second day, Rabbi Hanina says fifth day, as it is written in Genesis 1, verse 20, and the flying things shall fly upon the firmament of heaven. That's talking about things like birds. Regarding, and we're learning out, regarding the angels, it is written in Isaiah, they have two wings and, 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 and with, with which they fly. So we're equating flying creatures with angels with wings. Fifth day. Rabbi Levitas ben Tavros said, all agree, even Rabbi Yochanan, that the waters already existed on the first day. But it was the second day when he rafted the upper chambers with water. At that time, he also created the one who makes clouds as chariot, meaning the angels, and one who walks on the wings of the wind. But his messengers were not created until the fifth day. In other words, Rabbi See, Levitas just, uh, just finished this thought, says they're both right. There's angels of the second day and angels of the fifth day. The difference is that the angels that are messengers wait until the fifth day. Yes, David. No, this is absolutely beautiful because it basically just totally ties in to uh, uh, um, uh, Rabbi Hanania ben Hakana's principal student, namely Rabbi Ishmael, who basically does this whole thing about um, uh, uh, thesis, antithesis, antithesis, and th synthesis. Correct. The the um, so you've got this second, to the second day. Yes, yes. Or is it the fifth two day? contradictory right. verses come until the third. Until the third verse mediates between them, creates a, a synthesis. Yeah, so you're you're seeing that stylistically, where where we bring in yet a third way that reconciles the first two to some degree. Yeah. Um, it. I, I just want to point out that the yeah. Zohar has a very similar conversation to this one about which day exactly the Malachim are created, and they, they offer very similar reasons mm -hmm. to this and what, what's coming up in the next mission, I think. Yeah, that's why I'm going to just go straight in, because they, you can't really understand this mission without the next mission. So we're on page 9, mission 22. All agree that none were created on the first day. See, that wasn't even under discussion. It, it should therefore not be said, why, 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 what's the issue with angels in the first day. So somebody shouldn't make the following mistake. That Michael drew out the heaven of the south, Gabriel drew it out of the north. Each one of those angels respectively have an association with those two directions. Michael is uh, water, Gabriel is fire, uh, while God arranged things in the middle. In other words, there's there's angels, there's God, they all made the, they each had a part in creation. Don't, don't say that. It is that, that's written in Isaiah 44 verse 24. I am God. I make all, I stretch out the heavens alone, the earth is spread out before me. It sounds like the Haggadah when we say, uh, when God says, you know, I, I'm going to hit the firstborn of the Egyptians. I am not an angel, although that's not what's necessarily supported by the simple reading of the text in Exodus. But that's what we say in the Haggadah, that it's going to be God and not, nobody else. Same thing with creation. It's God. There's no other angel participating in the creation. Again, you have to understand, because we're talking about angels so much, we have to be careful not to mix them up with, with making them into God. So what does it say in Isaiah? I am God, I make all. I stretch out the heavens alone. The earth is spread out before me. Even though we read the verse from me, me'iti, it can also be read me'iti, me who is with me, question mark, meaning there's no one here with me when I do this. I am the one who planted this tree, which is obviously very similar to the Zohar's emphasis on the tree of life, in order that all the world shall, be, shall delight in it. And in it, I spread all, which sounds like you sowed if you're a Zohar person. I called it all because all depended on it, all emanate from it, and all need it. To it, they look, for it, they wait, and from it, souls fly in joy. This is a big, this became uh, repeated many, many times, probably 10 times or more in the Zohar, this type of, that those last few lines, okay? Alone was I when I made it, let no angel raise, rise above it and say, I was before you. I was also alone when I spread out earth in which I planted and rooted this tree. I made them rejoice together and I rejoiced in them. Who was with me? Question. To whom have I revealed this mystery? Wow. 
Okay. Hmm. Let's take a look at a couple of those verses in uh, mission, starting with Mishnah 21. Uh, he sets the rafters of his loft in the water, makes the clouds his chariot, moves on the wings of the wind. So obviously, let's say you were looking at that and you wanted to say, what does uh, the Evan Ezra say about that? So... Um, Basically, God is controlling the, you know, the way the nature uh, works, let's say. And then we're going to take a look at um, the Zohar. And the Zohar has a passage on... Uh, the first section of the Zohar, Daf 32, where it says, Rabbi Abba Pasach, Rabbi Abba quotes this very verse and says the following, um, the, these are the, the, um, higher waters, that through them, they rectify, takin betak modat they do the ticket on the on the home as the verse in Mishra 24 3 that we already quoted right in the beginning of the shir. The Chachma Yivna Bias of Isfuna Yiskonain, the first verse we quoted, that with wisdom he builds the home, and with understanding he um, he fills it in, fills in the rooms. Okay. So Another Zohar says that this is reminiscent of the idea of including the left within the right and the right within the left. And this is connected to the Ilna the Chai, the tree of life, and the Nahar the Nafik Me'edin. I mean, look, this that 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 phraseology occurs literally hundreds of times. This 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 tree and the, and the river uh, in the Zohar. A huge part of the czar. Let's continue with um, the other verse. Osa malach of ruchas meshas of eshlad. He makes the wind his messengers, his fiery flame his servants, and um, if you remember in the Sefer Yitzira, mm -hmm. it says. Esh mimayim, there's fire or ether emanated from the water. He established it by the throne of glory, the seraphim, the ofan, and the holy living creatures and angels. And all these three, he formed his habitation, as it reads, who made his angel spirits his ministers of flaming fire. So, you know, in Sefer Yitzira, we talked about the koach hagvur hanimshach menachesed. Again, similar to the Zohar, according to the Ramban, the power of the left or, or, or the judgment, which is drawn out of the love for the chesed, which is like the fire that comes out of the water and so on. Okay. And of course, there is another reference in this verse, in the Bahir, to um, this same, we're about to get to it in in in, uh, in, in, in Mission Twenty Four. Okay, let's do Mission Twenty Three quickly because we got to call it a night soon, so we can get to Meyer. For some of us, can run over. Rabbi Rachumai said, From your words, we we could conclude that the needs of this world were created before the heavens. There's a whole debate, remember, in the Talmud, Madrash, Zohar, Bahir, you name it. 
What was created first? Heaven or earth, right? Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel. Uh, king, he, uh, what does this resemble? A king wanted to plant a tree in his garden. He searched the entire garden to find a spring flowing with water that would nourish the tree. But he could not find any. He then said, I will dig for water and I'll bring forth a spring to nourish the tree. Again, this is very similar to this Nahar Hayotzim Eden Lahashkos Hagan. The, the river road that comes out of Eden to nourish the tree, the garden. He dug and opened a well flowing with living waters. He then planted the tree and it stood giving forth fruit. It was successfully rooted since it was always watered from the well. One more, 24, Rabbi Yad, I said, the earth was created first, as it is written in Genesis 2, 4, on the day that God made earth and heaven. They said to him, is it not written in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In other words, heaven first. He replied, what is it like? A king brought a beautiful object, but since it was not complete, he did not give it a name. He said, I will complete it. I will prepare it, its pedestal and attachment, and then I will give it a name. It is thus written, from eternity you founded the earth, and then your heaven to the work of your hands. It is furthermore written, he covered himself with light like a garment. He spread out the heaven like a curtain. He is a rafter. He rafters his upper chambers of the water. It is then written in Psalm 104, verse 4, he makes the wind his angels, his ministers a flaming fire. Finally, it is written in Psalm 104, 5, he founded the earth on its pedestal, that it not be removed from the world and forever. He made it, it he, when he made its pedestal, he strengthened it. It is therefore written that it not be moved. What is its name? And forever. That's the answer. Voed is its name. And the name of the pedestal is world, Olam. It is therefore written, and the world, and forever. So Arya Kaplan says, that heaven refers to the six spherot, chesed through yisod, and earth is malchut, this is for, on 23, and the spring dug in the earth is bina, understanding, the first hay and the name, the tree in heaven and is planted in the earth. That's, uh, that's on 23. 24, the basic question here is what was created first, the heaven, which is the light and the power of giving, or the earth, which is the vessel and the power of receiving? Rabbi Yane declared that without a vessel, there can be no light, and the vessel was therefore created first. He then goes on to explain that even though the heaven was created first, it was not given a name until after the earth was created, because before the earth was created, the heaven was not complete, and therefore could not be named. The earth is the feminine concept of receiving, while the heaven and the male concept of giving. The pedestals are Netzach victory and hot splendor, the attachment is Yisrael foundation. The verse therefore states, you founded the earth, indicating Yisrael foundation came into being from there. Okay, uh, sounds like the Arganus. <laughs> he didn't have the time he had on the Sefi Yitzir. He had a lot more time to go through a lot of commentaries when he wrote his commentary. Anyway, God willing, we'll continue. Um, we'll continue.